Hi, everybody. Ken Croak here. We're excited today to have Grant Cardone. I'll tell you, man, this guy knows how to bring the heat. We have never had a, a partner on a webinar be able to carry their weight on, on filling up and getting a wonderful audience here like Grant has. He, he did it just recently at, at our world record-breaking uh, virtual summit that we had. We had 33,000 some odd people join. And uh, and he was number one for getting his audience to be part of it, and and we said, boy, we got to do something with this guy. He knows what he's doing. So, Grant, thanks for joining us today. Ken, thank you so much. It's, it's such a pleasure to work with you and Inside Sales. Uh, I've really admired everything you guys have done for years. Well, thank you. It means a lot. We've Grant and I've got to know each other a little bit recently. I've had a couple little personal challenges with. With my youngest son, we had a good talk. He gave me some guidance and wonderful person. That, that meant a lot, Grant. I, we want to jump right in. We've got a lot, of, a lot to cover today. And we're hitting a topic that, uh, that the world seems to think is still really, really important called cold calling. And a lot of the tips and, and the million-dollar sales prospecting secrets that Grant's going to share with us. But I want to start just for a minute on definition definition of cold calling. People say cold calling is dead. You know, I had a wonderful uh, webinar with LinkedIn, and thanks to LinkedIn, true cold calling, where you know nothing about who you're going to call, I think pretty much is dead. But Grant, you've got a little bit different insight in what's working out there. Can you take a minute on cold calling? Well, Ken, first of all, uh, I have, I mean, you know, if it was, every call is cold at some point. This one's cold. We have people coming yep. in. They, 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 they agreed to come into this webinar. Uh, people are being hit with so much, so many things today that there might be many people that have joined us this morning out of the thousands and thousands that are here that are like, okay, what am I listening to? Why am I here? Who is Ken Krogh? I've never heard of Grant Cardone. And so I talk about this in, in the 10X mentality, in the 10X rule about it. The, the biggest problem for businesses is obscurity. I, I don't know you and you don't know me. And until you and I, Ken, started talking, we didn't know each other. The next level of the obscurity is that, that I know you. I know your name, but I forgot about you. So that might be for some of the people that have signed up today. They basically are warm. They've heard something about me or you or us or something but, but they kind of forgot why they're here or what we're about. And this level of obscurity, it, it diminishes people's value, their brands, their pricing, their possibilities. So it's my belief that you're going to spend a lifetime, until you become a freaking superstar celebrity where you can walk in a restaurant and they make a table for you, you're going to be, you're, you're going to be making somewhat of a cold call in order to expand your business and your brand. So whether it's a book deal you want, or you're selling a product, or you're trying to get a piece of software into the marketplace, or you have a new business idea, or you're trying to raise money, or you're trying to get a TV show like I am right now, or you're trying to call, call in the military to help them with vets that are in transition, look, if you're trying to do big things, you're going to be cold to the marketplace at some point. And, and that's my premise of a cold call. That makes a lot of sense. I agree. Uh, the little tweak I add to it is, is, is after a big, long conversation where we did a national webinar and a, a, a world record-breaking ebook with LinkedIn, we realized that you don't have to go into it cold, meaning what you should really do is do your homework, research, know what people like, know what they care about, know what their needs are, then make that call. And But but as Grant said, you're still going in cold in terms of relationship and awareness, and I love that obscurity concept. But but the concepts we're going to share today is, is how to bridge that. And, and, and from the master himself, Grant, would you take some time and walk us through some of your secret sauce today? Uh, hey, I would love to, Ken. You know, I would. I love helping people. That's our mission and so let me just see if I can get this thing set up. You guys have such unbelievable technology that sometimes I've got to figure out how to use what you've created <laughs> for me. So um, first thing I, I really want to talk about here is, and I'm not seeing the screen on my side. Maybe Mike can help me. Uh, there it is. Okay, so look, first thing to me is the most important thing, whether it's a cold call or warm call, whether it's sizzling hot, You've got to have the right attitude when you pick up this telephone. 
And for me today, a telephone, a telephone is, um, and let me just take one second, Ken, because I got about 3,000 people on Periscope and Meerkat. You guys go to Inside Sales right now. You can still catch this, and we're about to drop into the meat of it. So go, go grab that right now, Inside Sales and Grant Cardone, and you'll find the link. Okay, so, Kim, what I'm saying is the attitude before, before you start making the call, send out the email, and we've all heard this, we've said it, people talk about it all the time. Look, you need a bandwidth and an attitude that's so big. Too many people use the telephone and they depend on one or two calls. So when I pick up a phone or when I send an email or when I put a contract in, someone, in front of someone, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get my head wrapped around the concept that I can and believe that I can sell anyone on any deal in any situation, no matter whether it's 58 cents or whether it's $58 million, whether it's a very simple cycled sale or whether it's very complex. I give myself a little pep talk each time, hey, I can sell this guy. Even when, Ken, I'm in front of who I already know can't be a decision maker. So it's very important when you pick up this phone, you have to give yourself a little attitude adjustment or maybe a major attitude adjustment to understand that you can sell anyone, anytime, in this situation, on this first call. Now, while that might be a little unrealistic, that, that's what we want you to do. You know, the people that do crazy things are unrealistic. Number two, you've got to believe your product is worth ten times what you're charging or billing for it. You've got, to be, you've got to know that your product, it, the, it, the value of it is worth at least 10 times the money and the time that your prospect will invest in it. Number three, you've got to be willing to keep calling people back until they get on the phone with you. You know, I, I, a guy told me the other day, he's like, you've got to quit calling me. I said, look, man, you, if you want me to quit calling you, one of us has got to die. And it better be you because I'm coming back, all right? So, so you have to have this mentality that you're not quitting. You need to bring that into your call, and you need to let your prospect know that that's how sold you are, that that's how, how much in love you are with your product and service. I met with a billionaire yesterday. He just sold his company for – I'm in Silicon Valley today, and he sold his company uh, two months ago, closed on the deal for $21 billion. And he said, Grant, look, persistence is everything. You know, if you don't believe in the product you're selling, if you're not willing to knock on the door one more time, if you're not willing to go get in front of that guy after, long after he's told you or she's told you, hey, don't call me back, you need to find another product to sell. Number four, know your pitch. You've got to have a pitch down. That's where scripts are valuable and important. Ken, what you do with systems, showing people how to identify leads, how to connect the pieces, how to, build, how to build a rapport and a relationship with a client based on the social mediums and technologies available today is unbelievable. As important, you, you have to know your pitch. When you go into that pitch, into that presentation, whether it's two minutes or 14 minutes, it's probably not going to be much longer than that. What is your goal? Is, it, is your goal to close the deal? to find out who the other decision makers are, is it, to, is, it to, is it to get an appointment? And you're going to have a different pitch and a different script for each one of those. Number five, you've got to have a big claim. You've got to have a claim that's a hook that, 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 that the prospect cannot regurgitate, okay? What I mean is they can't spit it up. They can't get rid of it. The hook is so deep in the client that, that it literally creates a picture they can't erase, if you will. So like a hook for my company is, we're going to increase your sales 22% or more, regardless, regardless of your participation in the program. We do it for every company. We've done it for little companies and giant companies. So we're going to increase your sales 22%. Nobody can make that claim, and we'll do it in 60 days or less. So we want a big, big hook. Number six, you, you, need to have, you, you need to understand that when you're making a call, you have everything to gain and nothing to lose. Everything to gain, there is nothing to lose. Great salespeople know this. Number seven, believe you're the lowest price and the best value regardless of your price. 
Now, what that means is you have to convince yourself, even if you're four times the price tag, you're still the lowest price. Ken, I know you know what that means, but for the audience listening, Absolutely. look, if, if you're 10 times more money than the guy down the street, you still have to believe because of your service, your offer, your proposal, your unique proposition, that you're actually less money. So I just sold a, a real estate portfolio for $58 million, okay? And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, some guy was saying that they overpaid for it. I'm like, no, you didn't. He's like, we can get a similar product down the street for $10 million less. I said, my deal's still better. And I gave them 12 reasons why it was better, and they closed with me. So you have to really be able to do the math on why you're the better deal. Number eight, treat everyone respectfully. This is a big problem in phones. People that are using phones all day start treating people like the last eight people they failed with, and then they treat the one that wants to buy from them like, like the, the, the previous eight failures. So treat everyone respectfully. And number nine, never depend on one call. You need lots of calls. Anybody that's experienced, and if you're taking notes, write this down. If you experience rejection in a phone call, if you experience the sensation of disappointment, it is because you have too little going on. Disappointment and rejection are not emotions. They're indications that your model is broken and you don't have enough business going on. So real quick, we're talking about cold calls, warm calls, hot calls. You hit on part of this. Uh, we, we define a, a, a warm call as, as a calling a prospect who has shown some interest. There's some connection between you and them, between yourself and your prospect. It could have been from an industry event, previous sales call, referral. I mean, just imagine calling a referral. Can you give me a referral today? That call is basically cold. I'm having to interrupt this guy's day. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what he's interested in yet. I don't know what his problems are. You better know what his problems are. You're not going to close the deal. The single only reason people buy anything at any time is to solve a problem. If you're taking notes, that's major. Nobody buys anything except for one reason, to solve a problem. Um, so I could, have, I might have an appointment. Maybe, maybe the appointment's coming in at two. They plan to come see me about a car or plumbing or tile or social media, my, my, whatever my point of expertise is. Maybe it came from LinkedIn and there's a connection on LinkedIn or it was a response to an ad. Somebody hit an ad, responded to us. I had a gentleman that's in the cosmetic surgery field and he says, I can't, I can't convert any of my, my leads right now. I said, well, is the ad bad, the lead bad, or is your pitch bad? He, he seemed to believe the ad didn't work, okay? I convinced him that the ad was fine. He went from, from less than a 1% conversion to almost 11% with scripts. Now, warm call warning. I, I hit on this earlier. Look, if you're in any doubt about the temperature of the call, you're best your best to treat it as it's cold, as though you would a cold call and start over. What I mean is me and Jared, Jared's the vice president of my, my sales organization in Miami, we went on, we flew across country, had a meeting with all the decision makers and the influencers, which included four people at C level and E level. We walked into the meeting the decision maker had agreed to the meeting, had it on her calendar, knew we were flying in, was ready for the meeting, and when I started the meeting, I said, do you know why we're meeting today? And she says, I have no clue. Now, this would appear to be a hot lead. If I were to ask Jared on the way over there, how, you know, where's the lead at? What's the temperature? He'd have said, boiling hot, ready to go. This was as cold as as a lead can get. So be prepared for that. Be ready to start every deal over. Now, the structure of the call that we break down, and we got a lot of content, Ken. Ken, I think you and I have already talked about doing another one of these in the future to get into more meat of this. Absolutely. The, yeah, the We're just scratching the, call, the surface with this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so the structure of the call 
we basically have to five simple things. I want to set my intention up front. Uh, I was talking to Pharmacyclics yesterday. It's a, it's a, they just went public. It's a $22 billion company. And, and she's like, what, what is this whole thing about the intention or purpose up front? I said, look, when I'm doing a meeting, whether it's for one person, six people, or 16 people, or 6,000 people, I want to set my intention up front. My jacket. Uh, I want to set my intention. My intention in every call is going to be this. My intention is to have you. Let's say I'm doing a webcast. Uh, we're going to do one in two weeks. When I open the webcast, I will set the intention of the webinar up front that I actually want to convert the audience to a product. Now, most people that are doing webcasts and webinars, they wait till the last two hours to tell somebody, hey, by the way, we have another offer front for you. I, I want to be completely transparent. I have great products. I offer 10 times the value. There's no reason why I shouldn't tell people up front that I want to sell them, close them, and get my product in their company tonight. Now, what you're typically going to get to that is one or two things. There's no way that can happen. Or, look, I'm not even the decision maker. And if it's number one, you're going to get reasons why. Budget, timing, this isn't going to happen yet. Uh, I don't have the right people in the room. To the second part, I'm not the decision maker. Either one of them helps you. I'm not the decision maker helps you, and no, it's because of the budget is going to help you. But the reality is you're talking about your intention here, not theirs. My intention is to get you on this product. You're basically telling somebody how sold you are. Number two, we're going to make a giant claim, a monster, monster claim. If you don't have your monster claim in, you need to get this handled. You need a claim that nobody else can make. We're not talking about your product now. Okay, we're not really talking about your service or your company. I'm talking about something that, 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 that your proposition does, nobody else does. Third thing we're going to do is we're going to lay the pricing out. We sell a product, Ken, that uh, goes anywhere from 40000 to about $85,000. We tell people price before we show them the product. Now, this is completely and radically different than the way most sales organizations sell their product. I want people to know the price before I build the value so that they can actually attach the price proposition with the value proposition because the reality is you don't actually ever close anyone without them making most of that decision. So, so whether it's a $90,000 watch or a $90,000 training program, I want the individual making the decision or influencing the, the decision to be thinking with the $90,000 proposition. So even if I get an objection to it, I want this to happen in the first minutes of the presentation. In the first minute, I want him to know I'm looking for 90 k here. I don't want them in mystery about, well, is this 90 cents? Is it $9? Is it, how much is it? Because if they're in mystery, their confidence goes down and they can't make a decision. It is impossible to close a deal without certainty. So without information, without knowledge, without transparency, I can't make a decision. It's impossible. This is why there's been so much turnover in sales for, for hundreds of years. People hate selling because they're, they're having to actually deceive people or, or do something that, 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 that causes them to feel like they're deceiving by not disclosing. So I want to be fully transparent. I want to get my pricing out front. Worst case is, I was with a client three weeks ago. He's worth, uh, he's worth about $3 billion. He runs car dealerships in Boston. Um, he owns three planes that are worth uh, probably a total of $200 million. I've been trying to get in front of him for 17 years. I've called him twice a year for 17 years. Okay? Finally, finally cracked the code. Got in front of him, and I did this. Hey, Herb, my intention is to close you while I'm here today. My, my company can increase your sales 22%. I can do it in 60 days. The program's going to cost you $1.7 million. It's normally three and a half, but I'm doing you a favor because I love you. Uh, and he looked at me and he says, you're here, to, you're here looking for $1.7 million? 
No, I'm not looking for anything. I'm telling you what I can do for you. He's like, that's ridiculous. You'll never come back to Boston if that's what you're looking for. But the reality is he didn't even know what I was offering yet. So I just basically told him, Ken, of course you're going to object to the 1.7. You don't even know what my, my, uh, my, my value proposition is. Before I show you my product, let me ask you, if I could solve one problem that would be worth hundreds of millions of dollars to you, what would it be? He gave me the problem, I showed my product, and we closed the deal. So those are the five steps right there. Uh, I know you want to cover this. Ken, you've got a lot of data to cover. I, hate, I, I really haven't done the justice by just skimming through this content so quickly. We're going to greet the customer here as parts of the call. People can walk away with this and build their own script. Slide number seven will help them. This will be um, great. Yeah, so you can use that, uh, the greeting, the reason you're calling, qualify the lead, the appointment, and close. That is for people we're trying to get an appointment with. I think I'd like to turn it over to you, Ken. You know, I'd love to. I'd love to have you just talk about that first twenty seconds, if you got a quick minute. Do you mind doing that, Grant? Yes. Uh, the first twenty seconds. What I, What I'm going to do in that is, I, I, you know, I know this is going to make a difference. I mean, th this is where I make or break the deal. Who am I? Hey, my name's Grant Cardone. I'm calling. I'm calling for Bob. So, what's in it for Bob? Hey, Bob, I need twenty seconds of your time. I'm going to show you something you absolutely have never seen before. Okay, so I need to really get clear, why am I calling this person? Now, when I call people, the people that I'm calling are extremely able, financially capable people. People that have money don't have time. If they have time, they've got a lot of choices, and I'm probably not on their menu today. So people that have too much time typically don't have money. So if you're calling the right audience... You know, when somebody tells me I don't have time, I know one thing. They got money and they're decision makers. People that have a lot of time probably can make decisions and or don't have money. Because busy people make decisions and busy people have money. So why am I calling you? I need, I need to set a hook here, okay? Where did I get your name from? Mr. Duggan, Charmaine told me to call you, and she demanded that I get 20 minutes of your time, okay? What's in it for the buyer? Why should they do this? And then I need to check trust. How much of what I've just shared with you do you believe? This is a killer, killer question to ask people. After you've done your presentation, if half of what I've told you is true, would you make time for me? What percentage of what I've told you do you think is true? And typically what you'll have is you'll have a client exhaust any distrust they have uh, and say things like, well, I believe 80%. I believe everything you've told me. I can't wait to see you. But, but again, this is about transparency. It's about, it's about putting all your cards on the table and saying, this is my hand. This is my deck. Do you trust me and believe me? Uh, if so, take time to see me. Do I have your attention? Uh, my my three-year-old will walk up to you and say, Mr. Crow, do I have your full attention? Before she asks you for something, she knows she must hook into you and make sure she has your full attention. There's too many salespeople out there talking and don't even have the attention of the receiver. I had a gentleman in my office in Miami claim that I had ADHD. I said, bro, I ain't got ADHD. I don't have attention for you. If we're talking about attention deficit, the attention deficit is you don't have my attention. That's the only deficit I have. So, so that's on the salesperson. That's not on me. Um, Ken, I want to turn it over to you now. I've got a couple more slides here, but I think it's really important that your people get the, the systems here. Oh, I appreciate that. And, and wow, Grant, I'm I got a whole page of notes already, you guys. Wow, this is exciting. You know, and I'm realizing the synergy here. You've just got the, the art side down. You've got the technique side down. You've got what to say. 
and, and in every situation, you've got just a, a force that people don't even realize you're doing it because it, it's just so well done and so genuine. Thanks for that great example, Grant. I'm going to jump in here a little bit different approach, everybody. Uh, we get asked all the time about social selling. We didn't know we were being measured as a company, but our company was ranked number one in the country with high-growth companies for what they call social selling currency, and I've been ranked up there pretty good too. And the reason is results. And what I want to do, I've added four little bonuses right at the end to talk about some of the results that come from social selling today. But our topic is primarily on cold calling. And people ask me, you know, why is it that you use the word cold calling when, when nobody is uh, officially cold calling the way that it used to be termed? Now, Grant and I have helped to find that a little bit better. Now, Mike, is this, is this slide being pushed out here, the, the power of cold calling? Okay, let me look here. Hopefully you can see it, guys. Uh, I skipped it, going back. Going, okay, there we go. I wanted to illustrate. Now, this is right out of Google, and this was fun. This was something that we did with uh, LinkedIn, and we tested two titles for the webinar we did that broke all the records. And, and the first one was Social Selling Strategies in 2014 Live Webinar. We sent out to 36,000 people, and 5,000 opened it, and 1.5% click-through rate. And then we just used the word cold calling using LinkedIn. This is what made them so mad at us. Because uh, they don't, nobody cold calls with LinkedIn, you guys. But it increased the results by four times, almost, well, three times. Okay, that word cold calling is still people are so enamored with it. But the truth is, the real truth is, is that it's all about warm calling. It's about warming up that relationship as fast as you can. The phraseology, it, it, it's semantical, but. We've got to research and know what we're about to get into. We've got to know our value equation. We've got to know their need, and then we can really have a warm call. No one really likes to go in cold, they need to research well. This was the article that sort of set it on fire. Cold calling is dead thanks to LinkedIn. I just wanted to clarify that. But I want to get back to our roots for just a minute. We're InsideSales.com. People ask us all the time, what is Inside Sales? And uh, most people don't know what it really, they think it's telemarketing. It is not telemarketing. Now it's getting on the phone, but inside sales is a little bit different. Inside sales is a bit more elegant than telemarketing. And this person right here, Mark Benioff, the founder of Salesforce.com, most people don't know this, but he started his career at Oracle as an inside sales rep. And he mastered it. He, the light went on. He figured out that and many other things. He was the youngest vice president to be promoted at Oracle, age 23. He took the methodology, which is really professional sales done remotely, using the phone and the Internet combined to project a full-on presentation as if you were face-to-face. -face. That's the goal here. And it has really taken the world by storm. It's the fastest-growing segment of sales and marketing. Uh, it's outgrowing. T right after the crash of 2008, when everything changed, it outgrew traditional sales 15 times over. And even today, it's still growing 300% faster than traditional sales. In 2010, the inside sales world um, actually announced there are now more inside sales reps than outside sales reps. Oh, my heavens. If you remove retail, which is sort of neither, there are now more people doing inside sales than outside sales. And even face-to-face -face field sales are spending 54% of their day on the phone, on the web, selling remotely. Now, let's talk about some of the, the key things, though, that we've got to do. What Grant has done, and I've taken a whole page of note here, is he shared with you what to say, how to build your belief system so that you can go in and really believe in your product, believe in yourself, believe in the value you're going about, to, about to offer. But what I'm going to do is something a little bit different. I'm going to talk about the, the systems, the technology, and the levers that you can pull. Okay, So here, here, think of it as an old backhoe. You know, There's only four levers. But with those four level, levers, you can move a mountain, literally. And so we're going to talk about the things that you can add to what Grant is saying. This is additive today. This is not uh, opposing. Everything Grant said will work. Now add this to it. And, and here's the most obvious. Guys, just make more calls. <laughs> right? Make more calls. Then, as Grant has said, make better calls. Then we're going to talk about making faster calls. I loved what Grant said. You know, he's not going to quit. He's not going to give up. Be more persistent. 
Then there's a, a really strong model called specialization, and we're going to talk about that, and how to address complex calls with large accounts. And then most important is using technology to simulate as if you were facing some fun ideas for you there. So I'm going to jump in. I promised we'd first talk about specialization. Now, uh, this is this has been around since uh, probably the early 90s, and, and it came about as well, someone like Grant, who's a master salesperson. We all realized, you know, we should keep him in front of, you know, the people ready to buy. But wouldn't it be neat if we had an army of people finding deals for him to talk to and to, and to work through? So the specialization model splits sales first from support, then from lead generation. So appointment setting and closing are actually quite different skill sets. We're even finding it's different personality types that seem to be good at it. And then once you've got lead gen going, we found it's even important to split inbound response to leads from the web from outbound, as we've talked about, cold calling. They're different methodologies. They're different approaches. And just like Henry Ford, he revolutionized the world of automobile manufacturing by specialization, by that assembly line where one person got really good at putting in the engine, another good person got good at painting the car. Well, that's sort of how it's becoming, and we're finding that that's the level of specialization between what we call the transactional sales model, which is high volume, small business typically, smaller ticket items, versus complex sales, which is more about quality of conversation, about relationship. Usually in a large organization, there's many different decision makers that each have their needs and the value that need to be addressed. Well, those models are very, very different, and we need to know how to approach that. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest skill sets is to project yourself remotely. If all they hear is a voice, that's not as strong as if they see who you are. One of the first things we did is we actually put a photograph of ourselves in the email signatures of each of our people. Sales went up. Isn't that interesting? But the key to simulating face-to-face -face is typically web conferencing technology. What we're doing today with On24 is this exact same thing. Well, there's technologies that go individually, go to meeting, join.me, WebEx, there's all kinds of great ones that can project your desktop remotely to someone anywhere around the world as if you were face-to-face. -face. Now, Univer United Travel Services did a research study. This is pretty key. They had half their team were selling face-to-face, -face, half were selling over the phone and through the web, and the face-to-face -face people had a 40% close rate. The inside people had a 16% close rate. They hadn't taken Grant's courses yet. That's two and a half times difference, you guys, going face-to-face -face just based on the method of the media. Well, but here's the kicker. The inside people made seven times more contacts. So they still won the day. Now, the big deals, you want to fly people out and go face-to-face. -face, and that's what's called a hybrid. It used to be that going face-to-face -face four to five times was needed to close a sale. But after the crash of 2008, when travel constraints changed and, and people invested inside, now it's only about one and a half times you go face-to-face. -face. The rest is done remotely. And that's the key. Do everything you can. Video's getting big. Grant mentioned he's bringing up a TV show. Well, that, Because it's a richer environment. It, it, you can experience what it's like as if you were sitting in the audience listening to Grant. And so that's what's happening with technology, and it's big. So we did a survey. We've done this survey for years. This one is really interesting. We asked sales reps, what's your biggest challenge? What's your biggest problem? And their number one problem was accessing a busy decision maker, making contact with hard to reach people. Now Grant will teach you what to do when you make contact, but we've got some ideas to help you get to those busy decision makers, and that's what I've spent a lot of time on right now. We call it the seven contact methods. And Grant, I, I've had a chance to experience some of his other training. He knows a lot of this stuff. He's a master at it. But number one is immediacy. Do it now. The Internet has given us all ADD. We want to talk to people now. And it's amazing how fast things decay. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Be persistent. Know what time of day they're probably going to be available. Even what day of week has an impact. And what's optimal to your specific target audience. This one's sort of simple, number six here. And I'm going to walk through these here shortly. 
Call their phone number directly. Don't go through the main uh, debt. People say, how do you get past the gatekeeper? Well, it's really easy, guys. Just get the phone number for their cell phone or their desk, and you'll go right past the gatekeeper. That's the new way to do it. And then lastly, caller ID. I'm going to talk about that one. That one's sort of fun. So let's jump in real quickly to these seven contact methods. Then I promised I'd share four little tidbits on social selling, which is probably the most requested topic we get lately. Well, we did a research study with Dr. James Oldroyd while he was at MIT. Um, he redid the study again later with Harvard Business Review. And we asked, how fast should you contact people based on an inquiry? So let's say they go out to a website, they put in their name. How fast should you call them back? Well, this, this, stu this graph right here shows you five minutes, you guys. You've got to get back to them within five minutes. In fact, if you wait 30 minutes, you will lose 10 times the chance of reaching that person. 10 times, you guys. So, in fact, the, the original study was 100 times. So we've got to hustle. Um, we found that if you call people back within five minutes, the odds of qualifying those people are 21 times. You can see the bottom left there. And then the big question was, how fast does the standard salesperson respond to a lead? It's right there in orange. 39 hours and 22 minutes is the average. Oh, my heavens. So the best practice is five minutes, but the average is still 39 hours. Guys, that's like going into Nordstrom's and say, I want to buy a pair of shoes. And they say, well, why don't you come back? You go in there Wednesday, you say, why don't you come back Friday morning? It just makes no sense. So we've got to hustle. We've got to move. Let me talk to you about a different aspect of hustling. This graph shows um, how fast an appointment decays if you set it far away. That's a whole different mindset. So you can see right first there, the zero is if you set an appointment for day zero. So let's say 10 o'clock in the morning, I set an appointment for 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The blue line is the appointment show rate. The orange line is What's the chance of them qualifying into the sales funnel? And the green line is the close ratio. But look at that. Day zero, you have only 63% of people show up for that appointment. Oh, my gosh. And look, four days out. If you set an appointment four days away, 28% show up. Now, that's not specifically causative because if they're not interested enough to set it for today, they're probably not very interested in showing up to an appointment either. But things decay really, really fast, and we don't realize it. Well... Rule number two, persistency, persistency. What this means is you've got to keep trying. Now, the first call is still the best. If you call someone, it's like 37% of all the value you're ever going to get out of that call comes on the first call. But most people only make 1.5 phone call attempts on a lead or a list before they give up and say, well, they must not be interested. They don't want to talk to me. Well, the truth is they're busy. They're really, really busy. And as Grant said, I loved it. Don't quit. You know, one of us is going to give up and ain't going to be me, so, you know, unless I die. So keep at it. In fact, we found the average best practice should be somewhere between six and nine attempts if you're going to really ring the value of that opportunity. So stay at it. Stay with it. People will talk to you. Method number three. Let's talk about this. Time of day. Now, this is interesting. What time should you call somebody? This, this research was done twice. And here's the lift. There's a 147% difference between calling at the best time of day and the worst time of day. Oh, my heavens. The first study was done with over 100,000 data points. The second study with Harvard Business Review was done with 10 times the data, over a million data points, a million, million calls, and it still comes around here that you got the mornings and late afternoons and evenings on average are the best time. Now, I'm going to show you something a little bit different here in a moment. It, it might be unique to your industry, but in the mornings or the late afternoons for businesses are the best time to call. Now, what about the best day to call? Well, this is interesting. The worst day is Tuesday. I don't know why. <laughs> I think, I'm guessing, that everyone gets so dang busy on Monday digging out of their weekend. They finally dig out by Tuesday, and by Wednesday, they're ready to make calls again. I don't know. But for some reason, Wednesdays and Thursdays are the best days to make contact. Guys, 49% higher chance of reaching a busy decision maker on a Thursday versus a Tuesday. Now, that's interesting. Now, 
I researched some of Grant's study, and, and he, he had pointed out in one of his slides this amazing research from Baylor where there was a specific calling campaign into real estate, and the best time to call for real estate agents was between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. That's diametrically opposite, but guess what? That's when people are home that would have interested in real estate, and so you better test it. We did a research study with Franklin Covey, the largest time management company in the world, and for them, when people had been trying to buy something on the web and they opted out of, of, the, of the shopping cart, if you called them back really fast, which is our main rule, they got mad at you. Oh, my gosh. So Franklin calls us, we need some help. And we called some people back and we tested and we found the best time to call someone who opts out of a web page for some reason during a purchase is the next day in the afternoon. And we called them and said, why is that? And you know what? They opted out of a purchase decision because they forgot to bring their credit card with them. And the reason they were online making a purchase is because they didn't want to talk to anybody. So if you call them back really fast, they say, I don't need your help. I was trying to buy something myself, but I forgot my, my credit card. But if you call back the next day and they hadn't bought yet, all that frustration had left. And they're thinking, I still need to buy that thing. And so when you call back, they say, yeah, I'd love your help. That'd be great. So there's some really interesting and optimal times to call people back, and you've got to test it in your own environment. So that's rule number six. Call back at the optimal time and make sure it really is for your space. Rule number six. That, now, this one's really powerful. And I'm realizing my animation, we cut off part of our piece here, so I'm going to fill it in at the bottom. Okay, so... Contact method number six is use direct dial phone numbers. You see the row number six down at the bottom there that's empty? In your mind, type in 33. Now, this was a research study done with Vorsight. And basically, they were measuring these six representatives and saying, what is it that's making them so dang productive? And rep number six that's empty there had 33 average meetings per month. And here's the magic. They had 97.6% of the phone numbers that they were calling were direct dial phone numbers. In other words, they had the skills. Now, this is so common sense, it's sort of funny. <laughs> Instead of calling the main desk and getting stuck at the main desk, they found ways to find the direct dial phone number of the people they were trying to reach and had three times more meetings per month. They had 33 versus 11 from the worst rep at doing this. But again, 97% of their phone numbers, they had gone through the discipline of finding the direct dial phone number, either asking for it, searching on Google. There's even ways you can use um, with hot keys in the phone system. You can, you can press star six and opt out, and, and it will tell you their uh, extension if in, in like 45% of most phone systems. So there's some pretty cool ways. And th now, that has nothing to do with what you say. It's just getting the chance to say it. Isn't that interesting? So that's number six, getting direct dial phone numbers. Now, we'll fix that. By the way, everyone asks us, we've had several requests, will we get the slides today? Yes. We will make the slides to, today uh, available. We're also going to do a joint ebook on this together, Grant and I. And then Grant has got a really cool ebook he'll be giving you. In addition, you'll see that in the sidebar you can download. So we'll, we'll hit that here in just a few minutes. Rule number seven. Now, this is really interesting. Caller ID. <laughs> this is also sort of brain dead simple. If I call Grant and he looks at his phone, and everybody does who's really busy, they look at that caller ID on their cell phone, and the phone number says blocked number. Grant's saying, uh-oh, someone's trying to waste my time, trying to sell to me on their schedule, not mine. Or if he looks at his phone number and it says toll-free phone number, he's thinking, marketer. If he looks at his cell phone and it's a long-distance number, he's thinking, I don't know this person, but if I call you, Grant, on your cell phone, and it's a local phone number, it's a phone number that's the same area code you're already in, you're thinking, I better pick up. This might be one of my kids from school. It might be somebody I know. So we did that research study, and guess what, folks? The odds of you picking up a local phone number are 57.8% higher. Holy crud. So there is actually technology now where you can call from local phone numbers to get people's attention. Text messaging is also really powerful. Let me show you. This is a little added thing I wanted people to see. 
This was a research study where we asked, what methodology should you use to reach a busy person? A busy person still responds to email the best. Now, the blue is how likely they are to respond. And notice it's superimposed, which is what they would prefer to have you use to reach them. So email is both preferred and most likely to respond. Cell phone is next. Text message, look at that. The blue's really high. They're likely to respond, although it's not their preferred method. And then voicemail and office phone. So guys, this is all telephony right at the front here, right after email. And then it drops sharply for other methodologies. LinkedIn is still the best of all the social medias if you're going to use it as a messaging tool. But, but that answers a whole different question. What methodology should I use to reach out to people? Okay, I promised four quick little uh, tidbits on social selling. Let's, let's, let's throw those in and then Grant and I are going to jump in and answer some questions. We've covered a lot of ground fast. And uh, here we go. Uh, bonus number one. This is social selling. And now, it's a bit of a misnomer, everybody. People ask me all the time, and I was ranked number two in the world on social selling. And I didn't even know I was being tested. <laughs> because us salespeople, we, we learn we have to do something. We have to close a sale or it doesn't really count. So, and I have to tell you, honestly, I've never closed a sale through social media. What I've done is i found someone to talk to through social media. So it probably should be called social prospecting or social nurturing or something like that. But, but they call it social selling, so I'll, I'll go with it. And, and what salespeople are starting to find is they can offer their own content on their blog, on slideshare.net and so on. And when people download it, they got a lead. they got a hot lead that's engaged. They can call them back, and that person's eight times more likely to – close than someone that you cold call who doesn't know you. So social selling bonus number one is find cool content, put it out there on your social in LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook. Let people download it if they'll give you their name and their phone number. That's gold and a lot of salespeople are starting to generate their own leads now. So that's bonus number one. Number two is, and this one's really interesting. I, I figured this one out about 12 years ago before social was pretty hot. And what I would do is, that, let's say I'm trying to sell to a company with inside sales teams, which is what we do, and I want to find companies that are hiring and growing and have money. And that's the key factor. So what I do is I go out to Monster and Career Builder and, and, and local classified ads for KSL.com or whatever, and I look through the, the help wanted ads, the classified ads, and I find people that are hiring, and then I actually fill out a profile as if I wanted a job. And you know what happens? Every morning, I get about 10 new job listings of companies who just posted a job listing in inside sales. It comes to my inbox, <laughs> and they're ready to buy. They're, if they're hiring, they're buying. That's how it works. So, but there's a new way, and that's inside of LinkedIn. LinkedIn has job postings. In fact, the biggest part of what LinkedIn does is for hiring and uh, sales navigators coming on really strong, but most of their business is still in hiring. So if you go through the job postings, you can find companies that are hiring and those companies are ready to buy. I can tell you what. So that's number two is sift through the job postings for the kind of jobs, the kind of companies you're trying to reach and you're going to find a much, much better opportunity. Number three, this one's fun. Now, one of the hardest things to do is to get customer referrals. Well, this one's easy. This one's called a reverse customer referral, and it, it's, it's sort of fun. It was pioneered by one of our reps internally who actually became number one at the small business segment and then hit it again at, at, uh, at mid-market and won the Rolex this year. And he calls it a reverse customer referral. I love it. I'm not going to give you his name because you'll try and hire him away from me, and I need him. <laughs> anyway, here's what you do. You go out to your customers and you connect with them. Then when you're working with a prospect, you see if any of your prospects are connected to your customers. And then you let them know, hey, do you realize you already know four of my customers? And they're thinking, oh, really? And you let them know who they are. And they say, oh, yeah, I'm already connected. And there you go. It's almost done. In fact, half the time they don't even take the time to check with them because they're already connected with them. And if they've got the trust for those people to have done business with you, the trust goes way up for them to do business with you. So we call it a reverse customer referral inside of social. Now, the biggest one of all is next. This one's hot. It's brand new. Um, actually, it's not brand new. It's been out for a couple of years. There's a couple of companies doing really well with this. 
It's called job change alerts. Now this is one of our very favorites because a little while back we discovered that companies buy from us, for example, they buy new systems and new software to help their inside sales teams be more effective, even small companies, when the vice president of, ch of sales changes positions. There's this window of time when they bring in a new VP of sales, and that new VP, either her or he, they say, I've got to have my tool set. I've got to have what I'm good at. So they go out and they buy all the tools that they know are going to help them within the first 90 days, and then guess what? It's done. So there, there's a window. It's called a trigger event, you guys. And it can be job change alerts. It can be raising money. It can be moving to a new location. But this one's our favorite. And here's what happens. This is There's dominoes here because company A hires vice president A, and you've got 90 days to get in there before they make a decision. But guess what? Vice president A replaced someone who went to another company. So you find out where that person went and call them, and now company B has 90 days <laughs> to make a decision to buy. And then the first vice president came from somewhere else, so they've got to replace that person as well. So guess what? You call company C, and they've got 90 days in which they're going to make a decision on new uh, purchasing. So it's like a domino effect in both directions, and that window of opportunity is dramatically effective. So job change alerts, there's a little bonus right inside of Salesforce, of, of LinkedIn, excuse me, that even has an app now on your phone, connected app, where they'll give you the job changes that just happened this, this week or today. So anyway, wow, I'm talking your ear off, but uh, let's get to uh, a little bit of question and answers here. Grant, how are we doing? You still out there? Man, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm trying to soak in all this information. You're killing me. <laughs> I, I, I well, want to hang up with you on the phone. I want to call I'm the same. Phone. I'm, let's go practice. Let's try this out. <laughs> so, uh, okay, we got a bunch of, we got a bunch of questions out here. We're going to try and hit our best. And you know what? If we get a chance, Grant, maybe you and I can. And I've got to move here pretty soon, leave pretty soon. But we can answer some of these extra questions for the ebook. So we'll do our best. Let me let me hit a good hey, one here. Can, can, can I, can yeah, I tell please. you what? I got a little, I got a little surprise for you. I'm ready. I don't, I don't know. If, I don't know if he'll do this, but I got a gentleman that just walked in my hotel room. He just sold his company for 21 billion. I think he's on. He's on the Forbes wealthy list. Wealthiest list. He's number one. What are you? 180. In the U.S. Yeah. 280. Whatever. Okay. Do you have one question that Robert Duggan, self-made billionaire, one of the wealthiest self-made men in on the planet do you have one question for this guy that we can get out of him he's only going to charge you like 10 million dollars <laughs> fair wow the, guy, the guy's so generous i know that uh, that he'll he, he his commitment to helping entrepreneurs and hustlers and people that want to do do well is so amazing that i know he'll answer one question for us so you pick the question ken Oh, Robert, this is what a, what an opportunity! Thank you. I, I've got a question for me. I hope everyone else is interested. You know, there's there's always one one superpower that an individual has, one one um, you know one one skill set, one strength. And as you look back on on what you what you did to get you where you are today, is there is there one secret that you would share? That again, we got a lot of entrepreneurs, we got a lot of sales folks, sales managers on the phone here today, all aggressive, wanting to grow, wanting to learn. But what would be sort of that that special principle that helped you get where you are? Oh, great, great, great question. It's uh, I'll give you a little bit of a <clears throat> answer. It's more it's a little more difficult than just just one word or one item, but the number one thing that person asked to have is, is confidence, and confidence is a compound word. It's confidentiary, means with trust. So guys and gals out there, you, you've got to make sure that your confidence is where it ought to be, which is sky high. Okay, now how can you do that? We've all messed up. I mean, there's not a person on the line, or myself included, that if we were caught at our worst moment and put on the newspaper, we'd be, we, you know, we'd be sent to prison. So we, we're, not, we're not talking about that. What we're talking about is what does it take for us now, in present time, to gain the confidence so we can do what we do. It just, it, it's, this word means confidentiary. It means with trust. So we've got to trust ourselves, which means we've got to do what we say. That, that what I love about what, what you see here from Grant, right up, right up front, here, here's, it's $1.7 million. 
You know, really, I tell my people at my company, when I came in, we had one foot in the grave. And people said, God, we're going out of business. We don't have any money. So don't ever tell me we don't have any money. There's no scarcity of money. There's no scarcity of ideas. There's a scarcity of trust between one man and one woman, one man and another man, between the seller and the buyer. And when the trust is there, the transaction will flow. People are really concerned about ROI. Now, so I said, you, I, honestly, ask me, when you come back to me with a project that's got a 25% return, I hope it's got a billion-dollar tag on it because I love making 25% on a billion. 25% on a dollar, I don't really have the time for that. So think, think big, but the key thing, guys, is to have the trust. And when you've got that trust in yourself and you can reclaim it, this is life. Forget about yesterday. Life's in you today. You make your own tomorrow, but make your own tomorrow full of trust. Be honest, be good, be transparent. And these are the messages that both you and, and Grant have been pouring forth to people, but that's the subtlety of it. You've got to trust yourself. You've got to believe in your product. So you get a product, if you really believe in it and you examine it carefully and you know it to the edge of your life, you can call anyone at any time and for any length of time because you know what you got is something that they need they, they, and they can use. They just don't want it yet. They may not know they need it yet, but that's up to you. So those, those, I hope that's, that's helpful in a, in a little snippet. And, and just a million dollars of advice. Yeah, man. yeah, just right, right there. But the other little thing is that Grant and I are working on a project called the Genius Project, and uh, we're going to have some really nice stuff. The, the, the bloody truth is all of us have this embedded in us. We haven't been told about it, and uh, we've got the characteristics, and we're going to outline them and, and lay them forth, and we're going to have some real fun with it. So, yeah, life, life is great, and the future is bright. And I'm just glad to be alive and kicking in here. And, and it just was fun to walk into Grant's room here out in Rosewood and Palo Alto and, and hear all you guys talking about making things happen. Wow, what an opportunity. I'm done, man. <laughs> that's amazing. I'm going to go work on my belief. i got to get there. That, that That's awesome. Thank you so much for that opportunity. Um, yeah. We're, we're going to – can we just take a couple quick minutes here? Dang, I wish we, I wish we had a lot more time. But um, – Oh, we've got so many questions, and, and like I said, that right there was the opportunity, I think, of the day. A um, couple quick ones, just, just, just some interesting ones. Please, How and where yeah, can we Ken, build? That, 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 yeah, please. Ken, that's, that's the perfect example of value add. Absolutely. That's the perfect example. You know, I talked earlier about obscurity. If people don't know you, they will not conduct and do business with you. So the first thing is people have to show up to blow up. I flew across country to meet this guy on, on like four-minute notice. So you sales guys out there, entrepreneurs, guys and gals, you spend whatever money you got, whatever resources, sweat. Do whatever you have to do. Show up in order to blow up because you're not going to blow up from your living room. It's just not going to happen sitting in front of your computer, you know, 16 inches from your screen all day, uh, watching TV, Talking to your wife or your husband or your kids or what you do, you've got to get out into the marketplace. You've got to get attention first. The rest will take place. Uh, I asked Bob, I said, is attention the, the, the engine or the caboose? He's like, well, it would probably be the engine. I said, okay, because I don't know what a caboose is. <laughs> go, go ahead, Ken. No, I love it. I, I want to ask that same question of you, Grant. That same thing. I mean, you've, you've just hit it pretty hard, but this is such a rare opportunity. Uh, if you could encapsulate, you know, what's, what's got you where you are, I think we're all a little bit different, but w what's the same answer to that question for you that, that we just asked your, your, your good friend there? Well, I remember when I was a kid, you know, that, 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 uh, that uh, somebody said, you've got to have money to make money, and I'm like, well, then I'm doomed. Because I don't have any money, <laughs> you know. So I'm like, I gotta, I gotta crack the code on this deal because I don't have any money. Nobody around me had any money. My dad was dead. Uh, he he had worked every day to provide success for his family. It wasn't to buy bigger cars. It's because he wanted to take care of his family. He thought that that was his obligation. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't have any money. What do I have? And I and and I took a list of all my assets, and the one thing I had was courage. And I'm like, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to have to make my money on courage because I don't have any. And, and, and so, you know, I tell the truth. I'm willing to be criticized. I'm willing to be hated on. 
I'm willing to be seen, judged. Uh, I don't need everybody to like me. I, I just want to meet 7 billion people. I, I, frankly, I don't care if half of them don't like me. I just need them to know me. <laughs> and I figure if I can get half the people on this planet to, to if, you know, if I could get half the people in America to hate me, I could be the president. <laughs> And win with a landslide. For me, it's about, for me, it's about attention. I wish I would have known. See, Bob's a multiplier. Bob's a big incremental guy, okay? He's not about adding ones and twos. He's about multiplying hundreds. So that's why that 10x thing really, really speaks to me and should speak to your audience. You guys need to think in terms of multiplication now, not adding. You think in terms of ROI, not what it costs. Think in terms of expansion, not protection. Think in terms of affluence, not middle class. You know, the middle class is getting trounced. I, I spent 35 years being educated to the middle class when, when my family in the school should have been teaching affluence, prosperity, uh, no scarcity, and, and, and really risk is the new way not to be at risk, to take big risk. Oh, I love it. Got a lot there. Got a lot there. Man, we're we're rolling out of time. You know, I, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to add, you know, something I've learned in all this time. And I've learned that um, give back, give more than you ask. Yeah. And uh, I've seen that in Grant. And 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 life has a way. God has a way. Nature, whatever. You know, for me, it's God. And the more I give. The more I get back, and the more I give without worrying about it, it seems to be multiplied many fold. And, and you know, in our organization, we have a thing called the Do Good Foundation. And Dave Elkington and I, we started this oh five six years ago, and we decided every year we model it after Mark Benioff and Salesforce, and he gives one percent of revenue and equity and product every year. And there's a reason why they're all doing so good. Is because they give yeah. back and, and just just I yeah. mean you told me something I'm never going to forget Grant when we when we were practicing for this talking about what we're going to talk about you said yeah I had a webinar the other day that I I told them it would be about two hours I gave them four hours worth and I thought yeah. yep I get it I get it give back more than you ask and and a lot of good can come from and you know what's even more important you can do a lot of good in the world if you don't care who gets the credit and uh, yeah. thanks you guys Bob what a privilege. What an honor hey, to, hey, to Ken, meet you and spend Ken, just a couple hey, minutes. Ken, what's the foundation? Because I'd like to do something for your foundation. You know, it, it's called the Do Good Foundation, and and, yeah. and we try and pick a, a cause that uh, you know we've done things like uh, you know rebuild a battered women's shelter. We 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 we're working on autism right now. We're working on helping the genome project. Um, oh, that's we awesome. just had a. a a girls coding camp today so a lot of fun things i'll, I'll put tema who's over, our director of the do good in touch with if you don't mind grant but thank you for, yeah, for thinking of us and appreciate that it's an honor to have spent time with you two today and and boys and girls out there you better better look up because grant's coming to help the kids next he was telling me he's going to do some good work for the kids and give them some of these life skills so thanks again i apologize i need to run we're going to do this again right grant yeah, yeah, I think Bob wants to say yeah, one thing Ken, to you. Just Please. summarizing what, what all three of us said here in, in real tight consolidation, helping is selling. When you're helping, you're selling. So when you go into that sales call, you've got to go in with, in your heart, you know you're helping. That I know your product and know how it helps the receiving point. Because when you're helping, you're selling. People do business with people that help them. One of my kids came home one day and said, ah, I don't have enough friends. I said, what's the definition of friend? I said, somebody will do something for me. I said, why don't you just reverse it? A friend is someone you will do something for. Mm -hmm. And you'll have all the friends you can possibly handle. Get out there. Get it on. Get it going. So great to hear from you, Ken. Thank you so much. I hope to meet you face-to-face -face someday. Looking Thanks forward. again, Grant. We, well, this one's uh, in the record books. We've done a great job, everybody. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to spend time with you today. We'll, we're going to uh, schedule one again soon. Apologize, i got to run. But uh, okay, blow stay up. tuned. Buddy, the... 10x everything. Thank you. Thank 10x. You. I love it. Okay. The, the, okay. the slides and the ebook will be coming out here soon. Stay tuned. We'll have it ready for you. Thanks again, Mike and Kira, everybody, for joining us today. Talk to you soon.